Hello, welcome to the next in my series of studies in John's Gospel. We're trundering our way through John chapter 10 and particularly trying to think, focus in on this whole subject of listening to God. John 10 is very much about the shepherd and uh, it's a very rich subject to me. If you've been a Christian for any length of time, you may have come across this phrase of people saying they felt led to do something. It's a way in which Christians often try to articulate what they mean by following God, by hearing God, by listening to God, by doing what they believe God wants. What does it mean to feel led? In the next two studies particularly, I want to dig deeper into this and try and explore what that might be, what that might feel like. And for those of us who go, well, I don't know if I'm led, what that might be like. The context of this is this story in John chapter 3 where Jesus talks about the gatekeeper um, who opens the gate for the shepherd. So the background to this is that overnight sheep would be stored or kept in a pen, a courtyard where they were safe from wild animals and robbers. And then the shepherd would come in the morning to take them out onto the fields, uh, to the fresh pasture, the fresh grass and the clean water. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name. That was one of the talks we looked at earlier and he leads them out. That was our last study. And then verse four of John 10 says, when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. So we're going to look at this point at that phrase. He goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him. And then in the next study, I'm going to look at that phrase because his sheep know his voice. I want to unpack just two ideas around this idea of him going on ahead of us. The first is that he shows us the way. In other words, that Jesus, who identifies himself as this shepherd, uh, interestingly, in the Old Testament, it's very clear that Yahweh, the Lord, is the shepherd. And Jesus, by calling himself in a few verses time, the shepherd, uh, is saying, I am Yahweh, I am God. So that's a, a, an interesting thing to come to in a few studies time. But the first thing I want to say is that this uh, shepherd, Jesus, is showing us the way. In other words, he doesn't ask us to do anything that he himself doesn't do. He models, he's the example. So that's part of this idea that he goes on ahead, that we follow him. It's a clear understanding of the role of the shepherd uh, that unlike with cattle where we see the farmer behind the, the uh, herd of cattle pushing them, with a shepherd they, the, in the Middle Eastern culture, the shepherd went on ahead and they, knowing and trusting his voice, followed him. And the second aspect that I want to unpack uh, later in this study in a few moments time is that by going on ahead, he is preparing the way. He is opening the gates. He is choosing the path. He is preparing the journey. And we'll come back to that in a moment. But first, let's look at this whole idea of leading by example. So what I want to suggest is that in the New Testament, in the Gospels, it's very clear, and we've referred to this a lot of times already in John, that Jesus wants us to follow him, to copy him. Therefore, he's going to ask us to do things that he already has done. So I want to just quickly go through some of those things. These are things that we've looked at before. But for this purpose, it's us asking ourselves the question, are these things that Jesus is particularly asking of me now because these will all be part of our life at some point they may be the things for this week and so the fact that he's gone on ahead is he's pointing back to us and saying come and copy me come and follow me the first thing is that he loves the lost so in our lives one of the things that Jesus is asking us to do is to have a care and a compassion and an awareness of those who are lost. They may feel lost, they may not feel lost. But objectively, they are lost. They're not in the purposes and plans of where God intended them to be. They've strayed, they've wandered from what God wanted for them for their life. And Jesus loves the lost. And so he calls us to have that same compassion, observation. 
Who are we living amongst who've lost their way and are not living the life in all its fullness that God intended? We see in the way Jesus washes the disciples' feet that he humbly serves the needy. So again, that will be part of his calling on us. That will be part of the way he is leading us to not only love the lost, but to serve those who are in need. Not necessarily to wash their feet. That will be unnecessary for many of the people we need to serve. But perhaps doing what they need that is not, not necessarily the most glamorous thing or the most spectacular thing or the most appreciated thing. He calls us to love the lost. He calls us to humbly serve the needy. He calls us to copy him in challenging injustice. As he overturns the tables in the temple and criticizes those who have put a financial barrier between the poor praying and seeking God's presence. So he calls us to challenge and justice, to do what we can to stand up for those who are being oppressed. So again, we might ask ourselves, where in our life uh, is that a situation that we might be wanting to copy God in, follow him into that practice? He encourages us to ignore criticism and he models that for us. He doesn't ask us to do something that he doesn't understand or know. Hebrews tells us that Jesus understands our weaknesses and our temptations and our difficulties. And he knows what it is to be criticized and rebuked and for people to not understand his heart and not understand his intention. And so sometimes he will lead us through that experience because he's been there already. On the cross, he forgives the enemy. He says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And so again, he may well be leading us to forgive those who seek to harm us, who seek to criticize us, who seek a different agenda to us. How might God be leading us in that? In Gethsemane, we know that he... Uh, wept and struggled over that which was before him. But uh, Paul tells us that he uh, focused on what was to come. He put behind him the things that were difficult and focused on the future. And so again, he might be asking us to look beyond the problems and difficulties of this week and to see and be inspired by the joy that is before us. And so maybe what God is asking of us and leading us into is a sense of going through something difficult because on the other side is the glory that God has in store for us. He may be asking us to follow him with costly obedience, to obey him in a way that disadvantages us financially, that disadvantages is our career progression, that disadvantages our uh, popularity. But he's already led the way. He's already shown us this is possible. He's already gone ahead of us. And so as we follow him, these are the kind of paths we may go down. And finally, and perhaps probably most in the mind of Jesus at this moment, is that he goes ahead of us in resurrection. And he leads us to be resurrection people. He has gone through death and out the other side. And so we follow him through death and out the other side. We follow him in the expectation and the belief that he is the first fruits to rise from the dead and that death is not the end. And we know and believe and trust in eternal life because Jesus has gone on ahead and has died and risen again. And the, the tomb is empty. He has gone on ahead and we follow him through death. We follow him in loving the lost. We follow him in humbly accept, serving the needy. We follow him in challenging injustice. We follow him in ignoring criticism. We follow him in forgiving the enemy. We follow him in focusing on the future. We follow him in costly obedience. We follow him in resurrection hope. And some of one of those things may be particularly pertinent for this week but all of them will be a part of our discipleship.
Soren Kierkegaard is an interesting philosopher from the 19th century and to some extent a little bit controversial, but I love some of his thoughts. And he says this, these are words written over 100 years ago. He says, the difference between an admirer and a follower still remains no matter where you are. And in the days of Facebook where following has come on and means something different, these words are particularly interesting. He says, an admirer never makes any true sacrifices he always plays it safe. Though in words, phrases, songs, he is inexhaustible how, about how highly he praises Christ. He renounces nothing, gives up nothing, will not reconstruct his life, will not be what he admires, and will not let his life express what he supposedly admires. Jesus calls us not to be admirers who can sing and praise and talk and write books or tell others about what we admire about Jesus. Now he asks us to be a follower. And to be a follower, our life expresses what we admire. So our first question for reflection is what particularly is God calling us to copy him in this week? Which of these things that we listed are resonating for us now as we've just gone through them? What might there be a sense and a prompt saying, yeah, I want to follow you in this. And there's an opportunity, there's a circumstance, there's a situation where I need to love the lost or humbly serve the needy or challenge injustice or ignore criticism or forgive my enemy or focus on the future or obey though it may be costly or have resurrection hope. Now, the second aspect of Jesus going on ahead, the shepherd uh, being ahead of the sheep and calling us to follow him, is that he is preparing the way. And I want to just unpack that for a moment or two. But to do that, I want to make a very clear statement underneath this. That the, the, the way in which God prepares things for us is dependent on our heart having chosen to follow him. And in other words, these things I'm now going to unpack don't work if we're not set on obedience and the gender and the purpose and the plans that God has for us. But if our heart is saying, Lord, here I am, here's my life. Whatever is your will is my will. I will do what you want with my life. Here is my life, use it to your glory. When that becomes the foundation, then the following applies. That he does go on ahead and prepare the way for us. And the first way he does that is to develop within us interests and passions, things that we are, are, are we enjoy, we are concerned about, we are interested in. These things are joyful. They are not guilt and fearful. We may have a passion for young people or be interested in young people. We may have a passion for overseas, for a particular nation. We may have a passion for particular issues in life, particular circumstances. We have a, may have a passion for a place. We may have a passion for worship. We may have a passion for prayer. And God has prepared that in us. He's gone ahead of us in the way he wants to lead us, in the way he wants us to listen to his voice. He's prepared that in us. That is God's gift to us. And it will be different to other people. So it's not about, with guilt and fear, conforming to what other people say we should be passionate about or interested in. But it's just listening to the voice within us. That what energizes us? What joyfully are we interested in? Not out of guilt, not out of fear. It may be music, it may be prayer, it may be uh, the elderly, it may be young people, it may be a particular life difficulty, it may be a part of the world, it may be a our job and our career and whatever we're involved in. But God has developed interest and passions within us and that's preparing us for what he wants us to lead and, and guide. That's opening the gate, as it were. And secondly, he equips us with gifts and resources. He has given us the tools, the abilities to fulfill those passions. So when we say, God, what are you wanting me to do with my life? The first place is to start, well, what am I interested in? What am I passionate about? And then the second thing is to say, well, what am I equipped with? Am I good at listening? Am I good with young people? Am I good with languages? Am I practical? Am I musical? Am I a prayerful? Am I persistent? Am I compassionate? Am I caring? Am I able to, do I have resilience and able to handle other people's problems? 
Do I have finances? And we're beginning to look for where our gifts and our resources match our passions and our interests because that's the direction God has prepared for us and he's leading us into. As we're wanting to say, what do I do with my life this week? What energizes and what am I good at? And we're trying to join those two lines up because that will be the direction that God has prepared for us. And thirdly, as he sets us on that direction, as he's going ahead of us, as he's saying, come with me, I've prepared this for you, then there will be opportunities that he is creating. And he creates and puts people in our lives that begin to uh, match out our gifts and our interests. So I may be enthusiastic and passionate about children and young people, and as I do that, I discover that I'm quite good with them and they enjoy, they listen to me and they enjoy my company, perhaps. And then I discover that there are opportunities arise where I meet young people or I, I just find myself in that situation. And our opportunities are matching our gifts. When we talk about being led, this is what I want to to try and say that firstly we are led to copy Jesus but secondly we are led in this path that is joining up the dots of our passion and our interests then our gifts and our resources and then our opportunities and we're trying to, to, to follow that trail if you like like Hansel and Gretel the, the little sweets that have been left for us to follow we're trying to follow that trail what brings me life? What am I good at? What is presenting itself? It may be that we would say, look, I, just listening and caring for people in need enthuses me. And I find that I can do that. I can handle people's concerns and worries without losing too much sleep. And now people are coming to me and talking to me and telling me their issues. So you see how the, it joins up? And the last part of this is some, a phrase that we use a lot in Christianity, but I think it's quite a helpful one. It's the idea of God opening doors or closing doors. So as we follow him, there may be times when we think this is the way and he just shuts the door. The opportunity doesn't arise. We can't go any forward. And I think it's really important when we seek to be led by God not to try and kick doors down. In other words, the way God leads us is through our passions and interests, through our uh, skills and resources, through the opportunities, and then through the doors that he opens or through the gates and doors that he shuts and we, we change direction. But that God doesn't lead us through sort of manipulating and kicking against things. But there is a sense of flow to our lives. And this, for me, is part of this idea of following the shepherd who has gone on ahead of us. Seeking to obey God in a given week is not meant to be really confusing. It's meant to be a path that's becoming clear. It's becoming clear because we're doing what we want to do. It's becoming clear because we have the gifts and resources. It's becoming clear because he is creating the opportunity. It's becoming clear because he's opening the doors. And when our heart is said, God, here I am, I want to do your will, then that path becomes clear. He doesn't lead when we say, my life is my own, I want to do my own thing with it. So we have to have that foundation when the heart has chosen to follow, then he leads. So our final questions for reflection. What are the kingdom enthusiasms in our life that match our skills, resources, and opportunities. This week, as we say to God, Lord, what can I do for you? What is it that we want to do that matches what we can do, that matches what presents itself? So where is God calling us to follow his leading? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you lead, you guide, you have prepared a way. You do not ask us to do anything that you haven't modeled, demonstrated and revealed in Jesus. And now as we seek to obey you, 
Help us to follow that trail you are leading with the things you've placed in our hearts, the skills you've given us, and the opportunities that are presenting themselves. Help us to follow you. Lord, we desire that our lives would be glorifying. Help us to listen to you, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.